Thank you all for joining us today. Continuing on with our outstanding guest speaker series, today the TMCC Library Open Genealogy Lab is proud to welcome back Jeanette Shalika. Jeanette is from Lockport, New York, where she is the chairman of the board and vice president of the Niagara County Genealogical Society, a board member for the Western New York Genealogical Society, corresponding secretary for the Virtual Genealogical Society, the organizer of the North Tonawanda Library Genealogical Group, and the register for the Niagara Falls chapter of the DAR. She is a member of many organizations, including the National Genealogical Society, the Association of Professional Genealogists, and the New York Genealogical and Biographical Society. Jeanette has been a genealogy educator, librarian, and guest lecturer for many organizations and libraries since 2011. Her topic today is a genealogy lineage societies, and there are many different lineage and hereditary societies available that you can join and use their records to help research your family tree. This presentation will include an introduction to these types of societies, how to find their records online at the major genealogy websites, tips on how to join and more. So without further ado, I would like to offer a warm virtual welcome back to Jeanette. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for having me again. I loved um, the interactions that we had this past fall. So I'm so excited to be here again today. And we will get started with lineage societies. So today we're going to talk about what kinds of societies there are, how you can use lineage societies um, records for your research, and tips on joining lineage societies. So before we begin, I want to review some common terms that I might use throughout the presentation. First would be a supplemental application. So if you're a member of a society, meaning you've already joined them and had a successful application, but you want to prove a second lineage um, to a different qualifying ancestor to be, you know, also a member of that society, doing so is called a supplemental application, and they are often cheaper than when you submit your initial application to join. Another common term you might hear me use is registrar or historian. Many societies have a point person that will help you with your application. And some societies call, you know, refer to them as a registrar or historian. Others might even just use the term genealogist. And another common term I might use throughout is insignia. And insignia is the symbol of a society. It's often found in the form of a pin. And many societies have their main insignia or symbol usually displayed at the end of a ribbon where you can then add additional pins. Examples of different types of pins that you might have on your ribbon would be um, to represent the ancestor in which you join the society under, or perhaps committees that you're involved with or offices that you've held for that society. Some societies have very strict rules about when and where you can wear your ribbon and others, um, you know, don't care. They're like, you can, you want to wear your pins, you want wear them wherever you'd like to and enjoy them. Pictured here is my friend Jan. She gave me permission to use uh, her picture. And in the top photo, she's wearing her ribbons and insignia for the National Society Descendants of American Farmers. And in the lower picture, she's wearing her insignia and pins for the National Society of the Daughters of the American Revolution. So we're going to start our first section of the presentation. And I'm going to introduce you to many different lineage societies probably ones that you've heard of, and I'm hoping a few that you may have, you know, may be new to you. There are over 500 U.S.-based lineage societies, so keep that in mind that I'm only going to show you just a small handful, but I will give you some hints as to where you can go to look for more of them. And before I start showing some examples of the societies, I want to explain that there are different types of lineage societies. Some societies focus on an occupation that your ancestor might have had or a war that they participated in. Maybe they were a pioneer in some way or perhaps just based on ethnicity. There are also family associations, descendants from a single person, and societies that focus on involvement with a particular historical event. 
So the first one I will show you is that I already mentioned just a couple of slides ago is the National Society Descendants of American Farmers. This is an example of a society that honors a person's occupation. They're a fairly new organization. They just formed in 2019. And if you have a farmer in your direct lineage that lived in the United States between July 4th, 1776 and December 31st, 1900, you can apply to join. And proving that your ancestor was a farmer is fairly easy to do is they accept census records as proof of occupation. The Hereditary Society of Teachers is another example of society honoring an occupation. They are also a fairly new organization. They were just founded in September of 2010. And they have special insignia or pins for which century you can prove your direct ancestor worked as an educator. So for example, in the 17th century, it's, the pin is represented by a quill. In the 18th century, a bell. The 19th century is the lamp of knowledge. The 20th century is an open book. And the 21st century is represented by a computer. And current teachers have to first join under an ancestor in their family tree that was an educator and then they can file a supplemental application for themselves. You can't just join under yourself. And then hot off the presses, I literally just learned about the society two days ago. It hasn't even launched yet. It's going to launch at the end of this month. There is a new society forming called the National Society Descendants of American Railroad Workers. They haven't even released their website yet. Um, just keep an eye, eye out for them. You do a Google search in a couple weeks and I'm sure it'll start to pop up. For right now, um, in order to join, you have to have a direct lineage um, to a person that worked as a railroad worker in the United States between March 1st, 1825 and January 27th, 1914. And um, they, you know, they're just starting, so those dates might change. And they even said that railroad service includes urban transit rail systems like the MTA. So maybe they worked in, you know, in a larger city, not just more um, rural type of <laughs> railroads. So that's kind of exciting. I have a lot of railroad workers on my tree, so I'm certainly going to look into that society. The National Society Daughters of the American Revolution, or DAR, is probably the most well-known example of society honoring a military event. They have over 185,000 current members worldwide and over 3,000 chapters located within the U.S. as well as internationally. To join, you have to be a female that can prove your direct lineage to an ancestor who aided in achieving American independence. Now, not to worry out there, guys. I'm sure that you know you can't join the DAR, but don't worry, you can always join the SAR, which is the National Society Sons of the American Revolution. To establish eligibility, you must be able to prove documentation to confirm that you are a direct ancestral um, descendant of a patriot. The Order of the First World War is another example of society honoring a a military event and lineal or collateral descendants. Now that means collateral descendants means they don't have to be your direct line ancestor. Perhaps they were a brother or sister of your direct line ancestor or you know, a cousin of some way or an uncle. So they accept lineal or collateral descendants. Um, you can prove that you're related to a male or female who served in World War I loyally and that that person provided an active service um, towards the cause for his or her own country. So not necessarily having um, fought, but they could have provided service in another way. The Alamo Defenders Descendants Association is another example of society honoring a military event. To join, you have to be a direct or collateral descendant. Again, meaning you don't have to be collateral, just related somehow, or don't, you don't have to be direct, just related somehow, um, of an Alamo defender that was present inside the Alamo from February 23rd to March 6th, 1836, in service of the provisional government of Texas. That one sounds fun. 
The General Society of Mayflower Descendants is probably one of the most well-known examples of a society honoring a founding or immigration event. 2020 was an especially exciting year for them as they were celebrating the 400th anniversary when the Mayflower arrived at Plymouth, but sadly, due to the pandemic, many of their events that they had planned were canceled or postponed, but you can certainly find a lot of information about the Mayflower um, passengers on websites to learn more about them if you know that you're a descendant of one. The First Families of New York is an example of society honoring a founding or immigration event. You'll often see many of these referred to as First Families or Pioneers or Settlers programs. To join this society, you need to have a direct ancestor that resided in colonial New York from 1625 to 1783. New York isn't the only place where you can find a first family program. There are some for various states, Colorado, Georgia, Kentucky, Maine, and so on. That's just some of them. You can also find um, similar societies that are just called like pioneers or settler societies, such as the Arizona Pioneer Descendant Certificate Project, the Daughters of Utah Pioneers, the First Settlers of the Shenandoah Valley. There's one in California called the Society of California Pioneers that was established in 1850. And they have a museum and library in San Francisco, but they're closed right now due to the, to, the, to the pandemic. And membership is open to direct descendants of pioneers who arrived in California prior to January 1st, 1850. Many of the first families or pioneers or settler programs that I showed you are listed at Cindy's list. And on Cindy's website, you go to the category for societies and groups, and there's a subsection for lineage societies and a further subsection for family, um, first families and pioneers, of which she currently has 78 links listed. And that is in the handout. A few years ago in the FGS, which is the Federation of Genealogical Societies magazine, um, their forum, they did an article detailing how you can create a first families program for your own society. So maybe if you're involved with, you know, some or if you guys wanted to form one, you know, for the community college and the group that you have out there, you can refer to this article and create a first families, you know, for your area. <laughs> and that would be a lot of fun. I bet a lot of work too. <laughs> Switching now to share some examples of societies that honor a certain ethnicity. The first is the St. Andrew Society of the State of New York. It is an organization of Scots of lineal descendants of natives of Scotland. Next is a newer society called the Sons and Daughters of the United States Middle Passage. Membership is open to those who can prove direct lineal descent from a man, woman, or child who is of African descent and was forced into slavery in the U.S. prior to December 1865. There are many different family associations or organizations that share a common ancestor or surname. Many of them will hold annual meetings and reunions to celebrate and share information. These are sometimes referred to as single surname family organizations. If you have a United States president in your family tree, direct or collateral, could be Uncle George, um, you can apply to join the Presidential Families of America Society. And I can show you in a little bit later one way that you can find out if you're related to any presidents. A few examples of a society honoring a single person of significance would be the Order of the Crown of Charlemagne in the USA. This group was organized in 1939. There's also the Elder William Brewster Society where you must prove that you're a direct descendant of William Brewster that sailed on the Mayflower. An example of society honoring a historical event would be the Associated Daughters of the Early American Witches. Their society wishes to locate living female descendants of witches who are accused in the American colonies. There's also a society for men called Son of a Witch. 
I could not find a website for them, but it appears that they are active. To join, you must be lineally descended from any person residing in the American colonies prior to 1776, whom, as historically documented, they have been accused of witchcraft, persecuted for witchcraft, etc. And lastly, perhaps you're a descendant of a king from Britain. If so, you can look into applying to join the descendants of the illegitimate sons and daughters of the kings of Britain, or otherwise known as the Royal Bastards. And you can find their website at royalbastards.org. <laughs> So that's just some examples of societies that are out there. And if you want to look for more, there are a few websites, and we've already mentioned one a little bit with Cindy's List, that list many different societies. And don't worry, the, um, the links for these are located in your handout. So the first would be lineagesocietyofamerica.com. They have a list of different societies that hyperlink to that society's homepage. And the site also includes a few other topics, such as why join a lineage society, along with tools and charts that can help you build your family tree to prove your lineage to a certain society. They also can sort their list, you know, um, societies that are just for men, societies that are just for women, societies that are just for children, to help you kind of narrow down down all that's there. And I mentioned Cindy's list, and you can see the various subtopics that she has for lineage societies, such as military and war and occupations, for example, and that link to Cindy's list is in the handout. Wikipedia also has a notable um, hereditary and lineage organizations page on their website that have many hyperlinks to various societies that you can click on. And the most extensive list, in my opinion, is located at hereditary.us. If you click on the left where it says the Society Lists button, it will take you to a complete list of active hereditary societies. And each society on the hereditary.us site includes, if available, a hyperlink to the society's website and a brief description of the qualifications to join. Here you will see the information about the National Society of the Colonial Dames of America. Hereditary.us lists their contact info and then it says, you know, a little paragraph, membership is restricted to women who are lineal descendants of an ancestor of worth, worthy life who came to reside in the American colony prior to 1750 and who rendered efficient service to his country before July 5th, 1776, including service as a signer of the Declaration of Independence, either in the founding of a commonwealth or an institution which has survived and developed into importance, or who shall have held an important position in a colonial government, or who by distinguished service shall have contributed to the founding of the United States of America. And then it says membership is by invitation only. And concerning that, you might see that for various different societies. And sometimes it's as simple as completing an interested form to then be invited, or you just have to send them a message and explain why you are interested in joining, and then they will invite you. So it's just kind of a little formality. Many societies have their own web pages which include like members only areas or blogs and a social media presence. And if you are on Facebook, you may want to join the private group, the Hereditary Society Community of the United States of America, which is managed by that hereditary.us site that we were just looking at. And this is where members post news and events from many different societies, including the annual Heritage Week that is usually held in April in Washington, D.C., and this is a week where many societies hold their annual meeting. On the Hereditary.us site, they keep a calendar of all the events for Heritage Week, which I mentioned is usually the first week of April in D.C., and just to look at a few, you can see that the Continental Society Daughters of Indian Wars is scheduled to meet in D.C. at the Army-Navy Club on April 1st, and the National Society United States Daughters of 1812 is scheduled to meet at the Capitol Hilton from April 2nd to the 4th. However, due to the pandemic, many of these have gone virtual and they're not actually meeting in DC. They canceled all of Heritage Week last year also. 
And so a lot of these um, societies are holding Zooms to have their annual meeting. And if you're a member of society, I'm sure you've been getting emails already, you know, about the annual caucus and where and, you know, the Zoom information for you to meet. Um, I think, though, when we get back to being able to go in places that this week just sounds like a hoot and I it's on my bucket list someday I want to go to DC during Heritage Week and have joined a bunch of different societies and get to go to all these different meetings and meet new people and that have the same interests in me and everything like it's definitely it sounds like a great time. <laughs> Okay, so that brings us to the second portion of the program today, which is society records. And depending on the size of a society, they may have libraries and or published resources such as books or magazines or periodicals and newsletters, etc. You know, some of those records are made available publicly and others they might have just for their own members. One thing that they should all have is applications of who applied to join that society and the lineage that goes from them to the ancestor that qualified them for joining the society. And that's what we want for our genealogy so we can work up our family trees. The SAR, the Sons of the American Revolution, have a research library in Louisville, Kentucky, which contains over 55,000 holdings if you ever get to visit there. They also have published the images of their membership applications on Ancestry. So let's take a look at it. You can search the collection in the Ancestry card catalog and the title is U.S. Sons of the American Revolution Membership Applications from 1889 to 1970, of which they have over 1.2 million names in this collection on Ancestry. And within the Ancestry search box, you can search for the Patriot's name that the person joined under, the applicant's name, or any name in between. They have pulled every name that's mentioned on the application and included it as part of the index. They have images um, scanned on Ancestry that is, are available for viewing. Here's an example of an approved application for the SAR in 1943. And on the second page, you can see how, I believe it's the second page, um, the person applying, John Francis Forham, being of the age 21 years, is applying for membership into the society with lineal um, descent from Samuel Harding. And that Samuel Harding was born in Falmouth, um, Massachusetts on the 25th day of September, 1766, and he died in Sullivan, Pennsylvania on 16th day of April in 1850. And then John talks about himself. I was born in Waterloo, Iowa, and I was born um, on the 20th day of May, 1922. Then he starts doing the lineage. I am the son of Thomas Lee for him. He gives his dad's birth date that he's still living. Then he gives his mom's name with her maiden name, the date of birth that she is still living and the date that they were married on. Then he goes up the next generation, proving his lineage from um, from John to Samuel with each, um, you know, giving the dates of birth, death and marriage and and not some of them include place, but this one doesn't include places. The application also required a description of the Patriot service and the references to help to show that proof of that service on the Patriot that he was applying under. So that's what an SAR application looks like and they are available on Ancestry if you have a subscription to Ancestry. The DAR also has a large and beautiful library in Washington C that contains over 225,000 books. It's just gorgeous. I got to visit there in August of 2019 and I couldn't help but take a selfie when I was there to just help to capture that moment. So you can imagine the SAR library having 55,000 books, which is just amazing. Imagine the DAR library having over 225,000 books. The DAR set up their library with genealogy in mind. They have different sections for family genealogies and they are in alphabetical order by the surname that the, the subject of the book is on. So you can see when they organize, you know, on the shelf, you know, the, 
the bindings will say that you are in the family section and then the surname of the book. So if we look at those big white ones there, the surname is about Hardman and then Powell is the author's name, the person that created that book. The library also has books organized by location, such as you know states within the U.S. And then within that location are subsections, such as counties or periodicals or histories within that state. And when you are on the shelf for that, it'll list or in the library area for that, it'll list the state on the, the, the spine of the book. And then what, you know, that you're in the counties area in particular, that's where I was standing. So I was checking out books on my own county when I went to DC. I, and then underneath that, um, you know, a sub area of a book that, you know, maybe it's about a specific town within that county and then the author's name. A database of applications and supplemental applications to the General Society of Mayflower Descendants was released this past fall on the NGHGS's website, American Ancestors. NEHGS is the New England Historical and Genealogical Society, and their website is AmericanAncestors.org. This collection includes the application from the founding of the Mayflower Society from 1897 to January 1st, 1920, as long as the applying member is deceased. If you have a membership subscription to American Ancestors, you can view the actual applications to see the, you know, the de lineal descent from the a person applying to the Mayflower passenger. And you can also see what sources they used and that the application was approved by the society. So they agreed that the sources were of good quality. And then if, you know, if you're researching your early colonial America or Mayflower, you know, people, AmericanAncestors.org is definitely a website that you may want to consider getting a membership to because they'll have other collections that you might be interested in. I know, you know, some places, and you'll have to check around in your area, might even have an institute subscription on your, you know, that you could use also to access some of those. So you can ask around to, to any of your libraries or things like that to see if one, if they're open, if they have access to American Ancestors. If you don't have access or membership to AmericanAncestors.org, you can search Built Trees for free on FamilySearch.org slash Mayflower. And this link is in your handout. And this is where they use the first 30 volumes of the books called Mayflower's Families Through Five Generations. These are also known as the silver books because they have you know, a silver cover to them. And they partnered with NEHGS's, you know, at Mayflower applications with the Mayflower Society. And they re did that from um, when they were received in 1896 all the way to 2019. And they merged the applications along with the books together and they built a single tree that represents each pilgrim that came over on the Mayflower and their descendants um, from a time period from the 1500s to 1910. Now keep in mind this is not a complete descendancy tree. For example, my line isn't listed on there. So they're encouraging you to come back and check on it if you don't find a connection immediately that they're still working on putting it all in there. But that's a free resource that you can check out that tree available on familysearch.org Mayflower that has the information from the applications on there um, without subscribing to American Ancestors. You won't get to look at the actual applications, but at least you can look at a tree that was built off of them. Okay, so we're talking about different records. I'm going to do a little mini case study showing how I use lineage society records on my family tree. And so I was on Ancestry and I was playing at my DNA and I, I was looking at Isaac Lounsbury on my through lines that he was my fifth great grandfather. And I'm like, I don't know that much about Isaac. Why don't I go to his profile and see what I can suss out there? And one of the things that I had on him was a mention of him in a, a local county history, and it said that he was a revolutionary soldier. 
And I wondered like, hmm, I'm in the DAR. If he was a revolutionary soldier, I could do a supplemental application to Isaac. So I got kind of curious and I kind of went, well, I wonder if anyone else has joined the DAR under Isaac. So I went to the DAR's website and I went to this tab at the top that says genealogy. And you do not need to be a DAR member to get to this area. So you click on genealogy and it'll bring you to a page that looks like this. And then on the right hand side in the GRS section, the geneal genealogical research section, you click on ancestor search. And so I wanted to look for Isaac Lounsbury. And so this is where you put in one of those fields that are asterisks in order to try to get some results. And so I was curious because I have a picture of his gravestone that I took years ago, and it spelled his name L-O-W-N-S-B-E-R-Y, but the county history I had come across that said he was a Revolutionary War soldier spelled it L-O-U-N-S-B-E-R-R-Y. So I tried both of those spellings in the Ancestor search on the DAR page, and both of them were coming up no ancestor found. And I'm like, huh. Now that's kind of a little annoying. So I went back to Ancestry and he had some hints that I hadn't, you know, those green, they used to be the shaky leaf hints. I hadn't added those in. I'm like, let's see what else I can find. And I found a, a record um, for Isaac Lounsbury with the Ancestry collection titled Loyalists in the Southern Campaign of the Revolutionary War. Well, if he was a loyalist, then he did fight in the Revolutionary War, but it was in support of the British crown, and therefore he would not be considered a patriot eligible for DAR. And I was like, okay, I'm like, fair enough. But another hint came up, you know, for, for DAR again, but this one had, you know, it was a Daughters of the American Revolution lineage book. And this one showed um, Miss Edith Lounsbury that she applied, you know, to the DAR. And I was like, huh. So just as a little side note, these books, um, these lineage books for the DAR have been published. And what it was, was just the lineages of their early members. And they would just kind of strip all of the information from the application, except for, you know, kind of like the person's names and the years and who they married just to get from the applicant to the patriot. And you can find these books at local um, libraries and societies. They've also been digitized at Google Books, and they are available on Ancestry. I mean, I got a, I got a hint for it. So they're, they're definitely in there and searchable. Um, but keep in mind that all of the early applications to lineage societies, such as the DAR, maybe weren't as stringently checked over as they are today with today's genealogical proof standards and things like that. So many of the early applications might have errors in them. So just, but they're still good clues. So the DAR lineage book shows the member's name, her membership number. So Edith's membership number was 157171. And then it shows her lineage to the Patriot that she applied under. And just reading this through, it says, you know, Myth Edith um, A. Lounsbury, that she was born in Tioga County, PA. She was the daughter of Isaac P. Lounsbury um, with his years, and then, you know, Loretta Class is her mom with her years, and that they married in 1866, and then it goes on to the next generation, and here's where I found my Isaac, but I noticed that Eva didn't join the DA under Isaac, but rather his father, John, and so if this is the same Isaac that was a loyalist, the father and son fought on different sides of the war, which is kind of amazing, but that's research for another day. <laughs> I was just curious, you know, can I join the DAR under the Lounsbury, you know, name? And it also gives a brief description in this lineage book about John and um, what he did in the war, where he, you know, served. So Edith's last name was spelled the same way that I had found it um, on the gravestone, but I had tried searching that way without any success. 
And so I had to do a different type of search. And I decided to search by Edith's membership number, which is something you can totally do at the DAR and you don't have to be a member. So on that genealogy page, right underneath ancestor search, there is a member search. So I went to that search page and I put in Edith's membership number, the 157171 and it brought up her application and how the DAR decided that they were going to spell Lounsbury. So the DAR, you know, we all know doing genealogy that spellings weren't as particularly, you know, set as they are today. And you might even come across a document where a person has signed their name on the same piece of paper in two different spellings or something crazy like that. And so the DAR was like, we need to streamline this and come up with one way so that that person is only in our system once and not, you know, spelled a whole bunch of different ways, confusing everyone. So the way that the DAR chose to spell Lounsbury was L-O-U-N-S-B-U-R-Y. And so that's why I couldn't find it because I wasn't doing a search under that spelling. So thank goodness the Ancestry had given me those hints where I found the DAR lineage book with Edith's membership number so I could search by that. And when you look at the um, Patriot that she saw, um, joined under, you can see that a lot of different people joined under this person, um, under John. And you can see the first one, the national number was 105771. And then the second one, 157171, that's our Edith. And then there's more. And as the numbers get higher, that's the membership number. Like they started with member one. My membership number for DAR is over a million. I really wanted to get the million and I missed it by like a couple thousand. But uh, that would have been fun to be like, I'm the millionth member of DAR. <laughs> but I didn't win. Okay, <laughs> so also on this page, you can see the pink D where it shows the descendants. That's what the D stands for. And you can view the pedigree of each member that joined under that person with the first three generations um, restricted. And you can also purchase a copy of the application for $10. But again, the most recent, if you know, in case those people are still living, generations will be redacted on the application. I think the DAR settled on this particular spelling of Lounsbury based on his Revolutionary War service records. And thanks to that, I was I now had the correct spelling of John's name, and I was able to look up his military records on Fold3, which is a military website that's owned by Ancestry. And I feel confident that I found the right records for for John, that is my, what, sixth great grandpa, um, because the DAR's, you know, little description of him gave his service that he was part of the second regiment and the fifth regiment. And when I then did searches on fold three for John Lounsbury spelled the way that the DAR did, sure enough, the, the first two that popped up was the second regiment and fifth regiment. And then I got to see original documents with him listed in it. And I would have never come across those or found those original documents from the Revolutionary War had it not been for all those little pieces and steps that we went through. And someday I may do a supplemental application with John as as my patriot, you know, six, my sixth great grandfather, John, that's super cool. So to, to just recap all of the like process that I did is I found mention of Isaac in the county history book. And then I used the ancestry hints that popped up to, you know, suss out information about him. And one of those hints was the DAR lineage book showing that he was mentioned along the path of lineage for Edith to Isaac's dad. Then I used the DAR website and I did not sign in as a member. Those that those searches that we did are open to the public. I did it for ancestor search and member search by using Edith's membership number. And I found the spelling of the Patriot of John, and then I was able to find his original records on Fold 3. So all of those little pieces really helped me understand and give me more exciting avenues to explore for Isaac and John in the future should I want to go down that route. So that's the end of our little mini case study. 
And please know that there's many different ways that you can use society records besides what I just showed you with applications and lineage books and things like that. But that's all I had time to cover with today. You know, the Family Searches uh, Library in Salt Lake City has over 2,000 microfilms and numerous books of society records that I'm sure they've been working hard on digitizing that you can look up. And these um, records that they have might include application papers or yearbooks and ancestor roles or membership rosters and all their the publications each society comes out with. So, you know, play around with all the different genealogy giants websites, such as Ancestry, Find My Path. You know, American Ancestors, Family Search, My Heritage, you know, see what collections they have that, you know, lineage societies have shared with them. And that will take us to the third section of the presentation, which are some tips and tricks that I've learned for joining some lineage societies. So I believe that the first place, the best place to start is to build your tree as best you can with documentation and try to just stick to your direct lines when doing so. I know that I sometimes get off on a tangent and I'm following, you know, the rabbit hole way over there and all of a sudden I'm working on, you know, the in-laws of a cousin that's not a direct descendant of mine <laughs> and everything just because it's exciting to chase those records. But, you know, many of these societies, you know, want lineal descent. So really try to focus on your direct family lines and try to collect the, that birth, marriage and death for, for each person. Use those record hints that the uh, genealogy giant websites will, will share with you, you know, and because a lot of it, as you go back, you know, that those records have been made open or, or have been added to these sites that can help you build up those people's profiles. As I mentioned, birth, marriage, and deaths, um, the, a lot of these societies are going to want the most um, recent civil records, particularly like your own birth and marriage record and the birth, marriage and death of parents, grandparents, as, as recent as there have been vital records, they're going to want you to obtain those vital records until it gets to the point where you're climbing up the tree prior to vital records. And then you start using supplemental things such as church records or newspaper announcements or books that are accepted by that society. And if even if you think like, well, maybe I'll join someday, start ordering the documents now. Like if you know that your great grandparents death certificate is available at a county clerk's office, order it. A couple of reasons. I don't know about how things are out in your way, but New York State is over, taking over two years to fulfill um, genealogical requests. And other places such as Washington, um, and I can't remember the other state that had come up recently, they've changed their laws because of privacy. And, you know, for example, and I'm just making this up, you could order a death certificate um, as long as 50 years had passed. Well, what if the state assemblymen decide, well, we want to change that 50 years to 100 years. And all of a sudden, then you can no longer order that certificate, like unless you have to wait 100 years. And many of us won't make it that long. So it's just good genealogy to obtain those originals. You know, even if you, I used to say like, why do I need to spend the $22? I've got the obituary, I've got the date, you know, at the cemetery, I've got all this stuff. There's information on there that you might not know and, and you won't know unless you obtain that. And it's part of that genealogical proof standard of doing that reasonably exhaustive research, you know, getting gathering all of the documents that are of good quality and ordering these um, original civil records are part of it. So start collecting those birth marriages and deaths as much as you can in your direct lines or particularly the line that you think you're going to use, you know, for for joining. 
I found using the My Tree Tags tool at Ancestry to be very helpful for me when I was working on my Lineage Society applications. You can create custom tags to help you notate, you know, when you need a certain document, you're missing that document, um, and or certain qualifiers that can help remind you that you could be, um, this ancestor could be an eligible ancestor for you to join a certain society. You know, for example, I found my second great grandfather, um, he was listed as a farmer on a census record. So I created a, a custom My Tree tag for farmer to remind me that I could possibly join um, the National Society Descendants of American Farmers under him. I also use that to keep track of what holes I'm missing as far as what. Um, birth, marriage, or death records that I need if I've ordered them. You can also, there's a tag for direct ancestor. And then what's super cool about ancestry at these MyTree tags is they're searchable. And so I can then, you know, search the tree tags, like how many people do I need a death certificate for? And it will, you know, then compile a list of all of the people that I've added that tag to. Or, you know, I could start, now that there's gonna be a new railroad workers um, society, I could then add a railroad tag, you know, to all the people that I have in my tree that worked as railroad people, and then pull up and then I can see how many people I could possibly join under and start working on my lineage to them. I suggest also that you just play around with certain societies' websites to, to see what's out there. I, I gave you guys a bunch of different lists that have um, lists of societies. You know, click around, see what looks intriguing to you. If, if all the ones I've shared so far are, you know, you're like, maybe you think it'd be really cool to join the Mayflower Society and, you know, and what you can do with it. Um, so, you know, and then when you're thinking about it, start to like think like, do you want to just join, or, you know, and be done with it? Or do you want to be active with them? Because certain societies have, you know, local chapters or local colonies, and maybe they, they meet monthly for programs, or maybe they don't meet at all, you know, and, and so start to get a gauge as to the engagement that you can receive from joining that society, or, or maybe you don't want engagement, then there's, you know, another society might be better for you. Click around, check them out. There's almost always an application fee to join any society, and sometimes that's included with your, you know, membership fee and your first year's dues, um, you know, if your society has annual dues. Benefits for joining a society differ for each society. You know, some include a fancy um, periodical or magazine that you would get monthly or quarterly. And then others, um, maybe it's just a newsletter that they give out once a year, or, you know, they, they might have access to members only content on their website. You know, you have to kind of look at each society to see what um, benefits you might get for joining. And membership dues can be, you know, as low as $15 to join to whereas other ones could be more expensive. And there's some calculation because some societies will do a, a one time fee and that's it. That's all you have to do. And that could be a little bit higher. For example, the National Society of Descendants of American Farmers, it costs $300 to join, but they don't, you don't have any dues past that. Whereas if you join a, a different society, you might have a membership due of $40 to $50 every year. And then after a couple of years, you'll have paid in more to that society than you would a one-time fee society. And I'm not saying you wouldn't maybe benefit more from that, you know, society that has the annual dues. I just want you to know that there's different way that um, societies do their membership. You know, and a lot of it has to do with, you know, a one-time fee is a lot easier for them to manage. They don't have to have a treasurer that's constantly going after people saying, you haven't turned in your dues this year. Where are your dues this year? You know, like things like that. So, yeah, just keep that in mind as you're poking around and checking out different societies. I also wanted to note that some societies are accepting DNA as evidence to support applications. And, and you can't just turn in your DNA match list and be like, there, see, I match a whole bunch of people that also have a Mayflower person so I can join the Mayflower Society. Uh, it doesn't work like that. But if you have an adoption or something in your family line, or if there's a difficult generation that you're 
you can't just get the documentation to help you prove it, you could submit DNA evidence with an explanation to help you prove that lineage. You can't lean on it all by itself, but it can help you to get through, to get by. And when you're starting an application for society, I would definitely suggest going to their website and reading whatever rules they might have about your application and or membership. Now, every society has different procedures and it's very important that they're followed to help ease your application going you know, through the application process. Some societies provide all the documents and instructions for you to complete on the application yourself. They're like, here, here's everything. You do it, turn it into us when you're ready. Other societies will work with you and be like, great, you want to join? Let's let's talk about this. As, as a DAR registrar, I am helping people that want to join collect all of their documents, whereas other you know societies are like, if you want to join, this is what you need to turn in. So I want to share a little bit about my application process for the First Families of Pennsylvania. And to apply for this program, all of the directions in the application were online, and I pretty much completed the application on my own. I did have to reach out a couple, you know, for little questions, which they, you know, their volunteers got back to me. They were super nice and helped me. And what's um, neat about this society is you, you're you proving to someone that resided in Pennsylvania anywhere between 16 1938 and 1900, but they've broken down that residency into three time periods. The earliest one is the colony and commonwealth, and then the middle one is the keystone and cornerstone, and then the, the last one is the Pennsylvania proud. And I was so excited because I'm like, oh, I want to join in that first one. And then I couldn't, it got me like looking through my tree and working on it. And I realized that my earliest Pennsylvania ancestor was 1816. So I applied and joined under the keystone and cornerstone portion. But I'm going to keep my eye out there and see if I can't someday uh, find somebody that was in the colony and commonwealth section. So I think that it's, it's like a challenge extended that I need to like, you know, beat. <laughs> So for um, the application process, you complete the application form and you assemble all of your supporting documentation to prove your direct lineage from yourself to the Pennsylvania ancestor. And this includes all of the birth, marriages, and deaths for each person and then a connection into how the um, generations connect to each other. So on the back of every supporting document, for Per their rules, you needed to include your name and address, an explanation as to what the document is proving. So for example, this document uh, shown on the slide is for my fifth generation female. It is a death certificate and I was using it to prove her date and place of death. And then you might need to use a citation if it's not obvious what the document was. Now this was obvious it was a death certificate, so I didn't need to put a citation. But if you were copying a page out of a book, they would want to know what that book was, you know, um, what page it was, who was the author, the publisher, things like that. So you might need to add a citation. For my application, I spent hours over the course of weeks selecting the best evidence that I could find. My application and supporting documentation was about 90 pages thick when I mailed it in. And just as a very important side note, no society wants your originals, okay? They do not want to house them. They're not going to mail them back to you. Don't mail your original birth certificate to any sort of lineage society. They just want copies, okay? No, no sending originals. Okay, and they also don't want every piece of evidence that you could possibly ever find on an event. So for example, you know, uh, somebody's death. If you have the death certificate and that most succinctly answers the question that you are trying to, you know, when did this person die, where did, where did they die, awesome. That's all they need. They also don't need, in addition to the death certificate, the obituary, the funeral card, a picture of the tombstone. They don't need all that. They just want it succinct. Just one document that best answers that point that you're trying to prove. Uh, another thing I learned while going through this was you need to include proof of all of the marriages your ancestor might have been in. 
in this case, I needed to show both marriages of my third great grandmother. And I didn't think I had to because I was descendant from her first marriage. So I just put that one in. But my application, um, the person that was going through it came back to me and she's like, yeah, but you've got her death certificate and she has a different last name. And we need to know how she went from the first you know, her maiden name to her first marriage name to her second married name, you know, so that it matches the death certificate. I went, oh, that makes sense. And so um, we just easily found that online and it was no problem. It took about a month for them to review and approve my application. And then I received my first family's pin and certificate. And I was really proud. Like I felt like I accomplished this huge thing because I, I did all that. I spent all that time and effort. And I did it on my own mostly too. And then to receive the news that my application was approved, that someone had checked my work, it really gave me confidence that I had this well-documented you know, line in my family tree that I had found all the best documents that I could find, you know, those originals, you know, to, to put and that I could use that line confidently to join other societies should I want to because I kind of did it calculating, you know, in that this was a line that I could use, you know, when I did my Pennsylvania one, I could also use it for DAR, I could use it for Mayflower, I could use it for farmers, you know, this was a, a line that was in America a long time that I could use to apply to many different societies. So I felt very accomplished and I, I loved doing it and I was hooked and I was ready to, to do it again. I wanted to find another society to join. If you are accepted into a society, you may be um, more easily to join an, another society as some societies will accept proved applications from other societies, if that makes sense. So you apply to society A and you got approved and then society B you want to join and they might have a short form application where they can be like, yeah, sure, if, if you joined one of these societies, if your society A was on this list, we will accept your application without having to you to prove every single point. And it just makes the process faster um, and easier for you to get in if, if you're just proving the same line that it's already been proven. But they won't accept it from everybody because they feel that sometimes other societies don't have as stringent of an application process as others. So you can see on this one, they listed specifically which societies they would accept accept an application from to help you join theirs. And I just want to take a quick moment to share about how important it is to follow the rules when applying to a society. My application to the DAR had, had a few bumps. My local chapter's registrar had just resigned and they didn't have a properly trained registrar and they were doing the best that they could. But when they printed my application, they printed it off on regular size computer paper. And one of the rules is it needs to be on archivally, um, paper, you know, archival paper in legal size. So when my application got to Washington DC for the national organization to approve it or not, it was rejected because it was on the wrong size of paper. It had nothing to do with what was going on in my application, just it was not on the archival paper. So my local chapter tried, tried a second time. They bought the correct archival paper and they printed it off on the legal size. And um, they needed two members to endorse me, you know, that they would approve me joining. And those members signed in blue ink. And another one of the rules is that you have to sign with black ink. And so the ladies tried to like go over the blue ink with a black pen, but alas, National rejected my application for a second time. So then we did it a third time on the right paper using black ink and it went through within days without a problem because there wasn't anything actually wrong with my my application, just the form it was coming in. And some of you might be like, well, geez, if they're going to be that strict about it, then, you know, why would I join them? But the thing is, is that I kind of appreciate that they are taking this seriously and they're asking for archival paper with black ink on purpose because they're trying to have that application be available for hundreds of years to come in the future. And and why did I do all that work? You know, as part of it, I want to preserve 
my genealogy. And, and so I didn't mind having to go, you know, through the process. I mean, I was a little irritated maybe at the time, but, you know, looking back at it, once I understood what was going on, um, I'm glad that they are taking extra care to preserve the work that I did to join the society. Early on, I mentioned um, that I would show you a way that you can kind of maybe find some ancestors to help you join uh, different societies. And if you build your tree on family search, which um, you guys talked about this a little bit before the presentation, there's this website called relativefinder.org. It was put together by the BYU Family History Technology Lab, and they can search your family search family tree for certain ancestors. And as we know, like on Ancestor, we all have different individual trees. Well, with family search, it's one global tree. And if you don't have a tree on there yet, you, you start to add in a couple people and then eventually you'll probably get to a, a person, whether it's a grandparent, great grandparent, great great grandparent, that's already in this big tree. And you latch on to it because you don't need to create a duplicate person because they want to have one profile for each person in the world. And so once you catch on to that, other you know people have been working on it have already built out that line. And so you then have a, a nice large tree for them to search through. And the fun about this site is that it will search your family search tree for you and you can pick different filters. So you could see who in my family tree might have signed the constitution or the declaration of independence, who's perhaps European royalty, who of my ancestors was maybe on the Mayflower or is maybe a U.S. president. Um, and, you know, it's super fun. You've talked a little bit about Roots Tech, how you're going to be able to find cousins. They're using that same idea, um, using the Family Search Family Tree, where they're searching to see who matches each other. So if you have time this next week before Roots Tech, I would definitely suggest building up your Family Search Family Tree. When I joined the Mayflower Society, I joined under Henry Sampson. That was the only one I knew. And then I used Relative Finder and found out that I have many different qualifying Mayflower passengers in my tree, and I could join using supplemental applications for them if I wanted to. I also found out I have 37 presidents that were cousins of mine. And if you remember back at the beginning when I mentioned the Presidential Families of America Society accepting collateral lines. So I didn't need to be a direct descendant, which I'm not a direct descendant of any of them. You know, I could join under Millard Fillmore or Zachary Taylor and such like that. You know, I, I'm not sure how far the collateral goes, you know, if it extends to fourth cousin, eighth times removed, but I could ask, you know, it doesn't hurt to ask. <laughs> So there are many values and benefits to joining a lineage society. It helps to honor your ancestors and preserve your research to help future researchers and to have your research justified that it was done with quality. Filling out an application really helps you stay focused on a particular family line. And I know I felt a huge feeling of accomplishment when I finished. And if, if you don't want to join, you can still work on an application and not turn it in to just kind of practice your skills and put all that together. So we went over um, today the kinds of societies that there are, or at least, uh, you know, some examples of them, how you can use some lineage society records for your research, and then various tips on joining a lineage society. So I want to thank you so much for having me today, and I will be open for questions. I hope that some of you guys are jazzed right now and you want to go check out different lineage societies that you might be able to join. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen here. Thank you, Jeanette. That was wonderful. Um, now, uh, the first thing I wanted to point out um, that with the DAR and a DNA with the DNA, uh, DNA using for the DAR, uh, you can't use DNA for all generations. Uh, and, and in fact, last week, our speaker had mentioned that and the DAR reached out to me and wanted me to uh, mention that you cannot use DNA for all generations and that uh, if you want further information uh, to reach out to your local DAR register and uh, get further clarification on that. So I just wanted to you know, make sure that that was clarified for the audience. Um, mm -hmm. So while I'm waiting uh, for people to go ahead and put in some questions in the chat box, 
um, I, I do have a couple thoughts. Um, you had mentioned uh, in the intro that you are part of the Virtual Genealogical Society. Um, I yes. run a SIG on the Virtual Genealogical Society for the state of Nevada. So I kind of wanted to put in a little plug for my SIG. <laughs> mm -hmm. Are you, are you uh, in charge of a SIG on, on the Virtual Genealogical Society? I am not. And um, there's some exciting news I learned today with the, with the SIGs and um, some I don't, how do I, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say, but I'm um, transitioning and so they can be open to more people. So look out for info from, from Dan uh, to, to learn more about how they're going to be transitioning a little bit. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, because I know up to this point, in order to join the SIG, you have to be a member and then you have to request to join the SIG. And yeah, and you, and you have to be on Facebook. Yes. So. Exactly. Wonderful. That's good news. I'll, I'll look out for that. And then um, I wanted to mention, uh, I myself, uh, besides being DAR, I'm also a member of the Daughter of Union Veterans, uh, the Mayflower Society, Thomas Rogers, uh, and I've just, I'm waiting for my application to be approved currently with Colonial Dames. Um, and you had mentioned that some societies accept other societies' applications. So I had joined the Mayflower Society first and the Thomas Rogers Society. All I had to do was send them my certificate, a copy of my certificate, and they automatically accepted the Mayflower lineage. And uh, so I didn't have to go through the whole process over again. Yeah, it makes it easier. Uh, and you also mentioned um, pioneer certificates. Um, I have a pioneer certificate for one of my uh, Iowa ancestors, uh, and it was a very similar process to joining a lineage society. I had to send in all my proof generations, you know, uh, my generations listed on the application form, uh, and then they sent me back the pioneer certificate. And, and, and uh, the, the county I joined through uh, Iowa, they no longer issue the certificate, so I feel kind of proud that I got the certificate before they quit issuing them. Yeah. Yeah, there's some, um, let's see, Jan says something um, about she tried an ancestor search and there's a required field for ancestor number. It says you have to fill in one of those three fields that has the red asterisk. You don't have to fill in all three. So, you know, just anyone, if you know, you can put in a first name, you're going to get a lot of results. Um, but, you know, a last name or if you happen to know the ancestor number that the DR has assigned that Patriot. So you don't have to worry about um, about putting in all three fields. So that's a great question. Um, hello, cousin Ginger. We're both related to John Quincy Adams. It's nice. <laughs> Let's see, Connie says, the issue about correct application forms relates to the application completed by myself or by the, uh, Connie, I'm not sure what you're asking here. Can you unmute and ask your question? Yes, you were talking about having to complete a legal size form on a certain type of paper. Is that me, the applicator, or is that the society that's doing that? For That was my experience with DAR and the registrar, and I know as, as the registrar, I have the paper. So like you would help me, you know, like give me the information for DAR and then I put together the application for you and I print it off on that paper. Um, for other societies, when I joined the First Families of Pennsylvania, I just cut, I just printed it off on my own computer paper. They didn't require the archival paper. Each, each group is different. That's why I was saying to just um, check with the rules for, for yes. each society. Okay, very well. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Monica, yes, my tree tags are free to ancestry members. They are so much fun. I'm addicted to them. Like, I love my tree tags. There's a couple, if you go to YouTube, Krista Cowan, when my tree tags first came out, I think did a barefoot genealogist uh, talk about it. And so you can learn about how to use my tree tags, but they're an extremely useful tool and that you've got this huge tree. And you, if you want to narrow down it to just who are people that you know, are this, and then you can, it's like put, putting sticky notes on, on certain ancestors, like, okay, you um, are my direct ancestor, and I have your immigration paper, and I, you know, and you can just start tagging people, and then um, and you can make custom ones, as I did, like, I need death certificates for these people, I know they exist, they're listed in the state index, why haven't I ordered them, you know, and like, so I just kept tagging all the people that I knew were in the state index that have a, a vital record out there, and then I, I 
made that list of all of the, the people and I'm and I sat down I'm like okay let's do this let's get these original documents because I'm so nervous like what if there's a fire or something like or they shut down that they will they won't allow you to order them anymore I don't I'm just nervous I've seen too many little things you know I think and if if you find something even online, I think Thomas McGenty was talking about how in Chicago they had vital records that they had shared with Family Search, and then the city of Chicago decided we don't want to share them anymore, and uh, so they were taken off of Family Search. And if you hadn't downloaded that to your computer, you might have thought that you would um, be able to always have access to it because it's on Family Search. Family Search is free, but the person that was sharing it with Family Search changed their mind. And so if you ever find one, you know, also make a copy uh, to your desktop so that you have a have one there. Um, oh, Connie, yes. Do you think that she said that um, several of her grandfathers were railroad men? Mine, too. Uh, so you um, you are eligible to sign up for that very new society that's coming out. And what's super fun about new societies is that you can be a founding member. Like, none of us are going to be a founding member of DAR. They started in 1890, you know, and all this stuff like that. But you could be like, I'm a founding member of this society, and you could get, like, a special pin. You know, so I, I, I had fun being a founding member of the, the farmers group. So that was good. Um, Barbara, you stepped away. How do you obtain and use my tree tags? Is it an app? Um, Suzanne, would you like me to, after we're done with the questions on lineage societies, would you like me to do a demo when we stop recording and I can show a little bit about my tree tags? I think that's a great idea because there's so many questions in the chat box about it. Yeah, okay. Um, and then Todd says there's a limit to the number of custom tags. I believe it's 50. Oh, I have not reached that limit. So that's good to know. <laughs> um, you won't be able to see the tag. Okay, got it. And then, um, oh yeah, Diana, that is past the the, the time frame. I think they were saying they were stopping in the 1914 for the railroad people. <laughs> yeah. Um, can I repeat the info about the Cali uh, California Pioneers? You said that there's a library. I missed part of the conversation. Well, this is being recorded, so you'll be able to watch that, but there is a group, I think it was California Pioneers, a society, um, and the people had to have been residents in California prior to 1850, and that society has a library in San Francisco, and um, you can look on their website and see what holdings they have. They, they're probably closed right now due to um, uh, COVID, but they had some digital collections on their website too. So you could check that out. Oh, there you go. Thanks, Todd. <laughs> <laughs> okay, while I'm waiting for more questions to come in, I have a few things I wanted to share with the class. Um, if you're going to buy a subscription to any of these databases that, that were discussed today or other databases for that matter, uh, you may want to wait until Roots Tech because um, the vendor area will be open at Roots Tech online and you might be able to get some special discounted deals, uh, you know, to save yourself some money. So uh, if you once again, if you have not logged into uh, Roots Tech and registered, please do so because it's not just classes, it's also discounts through the vendors. And then uh, also I wanted to mention, if anyone didn't get the handout for today's uh, presentation, I sent it out in the invitation with the Zoom link to the entire class this morning. Uh, so if you didn't get it, just shoot me an email and I'll be more than happy to send it to you separately. And then uh, also speaking of the chat room, uh, if you wanna download the chat room today to, to grab all those links and the wonderful information that has been shared, uh, if you click on the three dots in the little chat box, uh, you can download that. I just wanted to remind you about that before we sign off today. And then uh, let's see here. Oh, uh, she talked about presidential genealogy uh, and joining the Presidential Lineage Society. Uh, we do have several books in our library. And if you need help with that, because our library is closed right now to COVID, just let me know and I'll go to campus and pull those books. And, and uh, we, two of the real good ones are the Burke's Presidential Families of the United States of America and also Ancestors of American Presidents by Gary Roberts. And we have both those books. And I'm more than happy to do lookups for anybody who's interested, because as she mentioned, you do not have to be a direct lineage, uh, direct lineal. You can be collateral as well. Uh, let's see here. Um, 
we talked about that already. I'm crossing things off on my list here. Um, let's see, we talked about that already. Oh, um, you mentioned the, the wonder, you showed the wonderful picture of yourself in the DAR library in Washington, D.C. I have a cousin who lives in Delaware, and her local lineage society makes road trips, which I just think is, is such a wonderful concept. And they actually took a road trip from Delaware to Washington, D.C. Uh, as a group and, and got a guided tour through the DAR library. So I just thought that was something I wanted to mention. And as much as I love genealogy, history is not really you know, I'm not all that interested in, in history and they have rooms not, you know, like in the building where the library is of each um, each state kind of manages a room and they're decorated in a certain time frame in a certain like room of the house. So if you wanted to see what a parlor in Pennsylvania in 1810 looked like, they had a room decorated like that or a kitchen in Kansas in 1760. And it was fascinating. I I just I went to every single room because then I was thinking about my ancestors and like, okay, who did I know that lived during this decade? This is what they lived like, you know, and it, it really connected to me. I, I had I had emotions, you know, like going on with those. So if you ever get a chance to go to D.C. to, to visit, I highly suggest visiting the D.A.R. library. And I wanted to mention, um, I actually did a, a very small book, only 40 pages on my D.A.R. ancestors line and published it, you know, in limited print because I self-published it. Uh, and the DAR library accepted it because it was on my DAR ancestor. So if anyone's okay. interested in writing a book on their DAR ancestor, um, I'd be more than happy to share my experience if, if you think it's a benefit. Um, let's see here. Um, oh, you know, you mentioned about how you can use, you know, one uh, ancestor for multiple lineage societies. I got to tell you, I learned a real hard lesson, and, and I don't know why it took me several applications before I learned the lesson. Um, but I, I my, the first time I joined on my ancestor, um, I went ahead and made a paper file and put it in a manila folder. And then I just started, you know, re-Xeroxing re it. And I found within like two or three Xeroxes, all of a sudden you couldn't really read the uh, writing very well anymore. So I, I had to go back through my original uh, documents and digitize everything. Uh, but word of, of uh, advice you know, from somebody who kind of fell down the wrong rabbit hole with it, um, make digital copies with your citation information. Uh, that way, it's so much easier to submit an application uh, because otherwise you have to go through and, you know, find all the uh, the original documents all over again like I did. And, and it just took a lot more time than it needed to. So I just wanted to share that with the class. Um, also, a, a few months ago, we had a guest speaker uh, who worked in a library and she would allow um, our, the people in my class to have free access to Fold3. Uh, so if you did not attend my class that day, uh, send me an email directly and I'll be more than happy to send you the information of what library that is. And then you can get in and uh, get a free subscription to Fold3. Uh, also, um, you mentioned the long waiting times for New York. Um, our guest speaker last week actually talked about that, and she let us know that there's actually a Facebook page that is now tracing waiting times uh, for genealogical documents from the state of New York. So I kind of yeah, thought that was interesting. it's a New York genealogy, I think, or something New York family genealogy, something like that. Um, it is always better, and I don't know if other states are like this, but for New York don't order it from the state, order it from the local municipality. Um, you can get it within a day and sometimes for a dollar. Um, so that is just my strong, strong advice for New York State. Don't order it from Albany, get it from whatever county, you know, um, city, town, village, wherever the event happened. Wonderful. Okay, so class, I, I go ahead and if you have any more questions, please put them in the chat box or unmute your microphone. Not your camera, but your microphone, because we are recording. And, and if you don't, unless you want your picture to be shown on YouTube, uh, just unmute your microphone or put it in the chat box. And if there's no further questions, then I'll go ahead and I'll stop the recording and uh, we'll go ahead and continue. And she's going to be, Jeanette's going to be generous enough to show us how to use those tags. So I'll just give it a few more seconds just to make sure that there's no last minute questions. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording, and and uh, Matt, I want to thank you once again for not only being our guest speaker today and, and giving us such wonderful information, uh, but also for allowing us to record the uh, the presentation. So I, I know there'll be lots of views on YouTube for it. So.